literally, in my opinion, your office is basically the only one out there in the country that has any clue as to how to handle these cases. I have yet to meet any other medical, um, practice, medically um, oriented law practice that knows how to handle the defense for doctors being charged with this crime. Um, and they generally all use the standard white collar approaches, which simply won't work. Thank you and welcome to another edition of Healthcare Hot Topics. My name is Ron Chapman from the Chapman Law Group. And today I have Linda Cheek for you. Um, Linda Cheek is the director of Doctors of Courage. And she's been instrumental in assisting physicians who are facing prosecutions or indictment by the Department of Justice and helping them understand their rights and point them to the right resources. Linda, how are you today? I'm just wonderful. Thank you, Ron. Great. Can you please tell us a little bit about Doctors of Courage and what you do? Yes. Doctors of Courage is primarily a website, but it's also an organization. And we are uh, formed in order to try to help doctors to prevent, first off, attacks from the government. And secondly, in case they are attacked using the Controlled Substance Act, then we try to guide them in a direction that they can uh, plan their defense that they can make choices, that they can be educated as to what the, behind what the cause of all of this is, because for the most part, doctors are so naive, and they think that as long as they're doing things right in the office and doing everything appropriately according to the law, that they are protected, and that is not the case. How did, let, let's, go, let's go to your background. How did you first get started with uh, Doctors of Courage? What was your motivation for developing the site? I was one of those that was attacked. I was actually attacked twice. I was attacked first in 2006, and uh, they could only come up with a charge of Medicare fraud based on X visits that my nurse practitioners billed to my number instead of theirs, uh, even though what we did, we considered it to be legal and appropriate. So I accepted a plea agreement in 2006, but they completely from the beginning intended to close me down. So they attacked me again in 2010. And that time they can, uh, I decided I wouldn't take a plea, that I would fight it because I was innocent. But uh, that's one of the things we try to teach doctors is that innocence is really of no importance. And so I ended up being convicted. Then uh, 26 months incarcerated at Alderson Prison Camp in West Virginia, and then um, I came out of there with the with the plan and the, the decision to try to stop this from happening from up to other doctors. Can you? So that's how the first got started. Can you tell us about your experience in Alderson and what that was like for you for those 26 months? Oh boy. Um, Alderson, well, actually, I only spent one year in Alderson because I was really a thorn in their side. Um, Alderson is not a uh, camp cupcake like they claim it to be. Uh, this is where Martha Stewart was uh, also incarcerated for six months. And I must say that of, all, of the two prisons that I spent time in, it was the absolute worst. The uh, inmate, the uh, people treat you very poorly. Uh, I was transferred into SFF Hazleton, which is up in the northern regions of West Virginia, and they were more, much more respectful. They actually, when they broke the, the rules of prisons, they actually did listen to my complaint and did something about it in some cases. Most cases they didn't, but because they are completely immune to any type of uh, prosecution if they do break the law. But um, prison was definitely a learning experience, and um, it was, it was no fun, and Alderson was the absolute worst. I saw so much abuse of residents in Alderson that uh, you know, I, I'm planning on writing books about that. Well, certainly, thank you for sharing that. I'd like to learn a little bit more about your experience there. How, how, was, um, how was your experience as a physician going into that environment? Do you feel that that set you apart or made you different than some of the other inmates? No. 
because in prison, you're basically whoever you say you are to the other inmates. So nobody really took me as anything more important or special than any of them. I mean, I was in prisons with mafia leaders who they claim to be mafia. Never know. Um, I was an older person. I did get respect from the minority communities. I was not really respected by the uh, Anglo uh, ladies. But the minority communities did at least respect me because of my age. Um, I had, I developed some good friendships. I met a lot of other people that are innocent. Uh, people put in prison for mortgage, for the mortgage fraud situation that should not have been. They were innocent. All they did was send an email from their boss to another person, and they are guilty of conspiracy. Conspiracy is the absolute worst when it comes to putting innocent people in prison. And the government is using it up one side and down the other, putting everybody in. You can't defend yourself against this conspiracy charge. So that it's just it's, it's money making now on the government's part, putting people in prison. We've got to stop it. We've got to do something about our justice department and the illegal attack on people. Yeah, you you mentioned the the conspiracy charge and how that's been used by the Department of Justice to, in some cases, make a lot of money. And, and, and my understanding as an attorney of conspiracy charges is that the evidentiary requirements to bring a charge of conspiracy against somebody is a lot less than bringing a charge um, related to the offense. For instance, conspiracy to commit healthcare fraud requires just an agreement to commit healthcare fraud in some act in furtherance, whereas healthcare fraud requires that you devise a scheme or artifice to execute. A healthcare fraud. Did, did you notice that a lot of the people that um, were in a federal institution with you were in there as a result of conspiracy charges, or did you find that it was related to a lot of other different types of charges? It was a lot of conspiracy charges, especially because of the mortgage fraud situation. And the thing that interested me was there were people in prison um, on charges of conspiracy where they were the only ones. How can you conspire when you're the only person in the conspiracy? Uh, to me, that goes against the definition of conspiracy. There should at least be two people. But yeah. there are a lot of people that are, you know, charged with conspiracy just based on what they did. And well, you're absolutely right, Linda. Um, but there's this concept of unindicted co-conspirators where uh, sometimes the government likes to charge somebody with conspiracy but not say in the indictment who else they conspired with. It would usually say... Tom Smith conspired with others to commit XYZ criminal offense. And so in many cases, the government may not even disclose who the co-conspirators were um, and get somebody to, uh, to plead guilty. Now, given, given um, the recent environment that we're in with uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your experience in prison and um, what what some of the dangers are facing uh, folks in prison. I can tell you that I've gotten emails, phone calls, letters um, from clients all across the country, from, from Hawaii to Maine, um, informing me that uh, they would like to get released uh, as a result of coronavirus and their risks. Um, I'd like to first ask, do you feel that uh, federal institutions can properly protect inmates from the dangers of coronavirus, especially an older population um, like you were when you were when you were in? Definitely not. They're not equipped and they really don't care to protect inmates against the coronavirus. Um, they are overwhelmed as far as population. Um, the rule in federal prison is that you're supposed to have 92 square feet per inmate and they have a minimum of four people in a 9 by 12, 12 cells. And that's in the women's prison. In the men's prison, they are so overwhelmed uh, with population that they literally, and I've heard of, of course, I haven't been in the men's prison, but I've heard of where they have the standard four bunks in a cell, but then they have a fifth person sleeping on the floor. And that is in a nine by 12 cell, which is not going to be 92 square feet per inmate. So then there is no means of hand sanitizers, no. Um, sanitary function. If a person ends up sick, basically they're simply left in the cell to contaminate other people. There's not going to be any movement. They don't have any place to move them to. They don't have beds. And they're sure not going to take the time 
to take an inmate to a, to a local hospital. I have actually seen, and not even with coronavirus, I have seen inmates that are sick, that are dying, that tell the guards that I need to go to the hospital, and they are ignored, and they are, and they die, and they are taken out the next day and sent to the morgue. I really do see that that's what's going to happen for most of the prisoners in prisons once the coronavirus hits the prison walls. How um, how would a prison normally treat a patient with a serious medical condition or health care concern? Do they have facilities inside of these prisons, such as Alderson, or is the prisoner required to be transported to some other location for treatment? They have general practitioners that are assigned to the prison that basically will see a person that's sick. They generally don't do anything for them as far as illness. It was a joking thing at Alderson that, if you get sick and you need to go to the doctor, you pay four dollars to, to do the visit, and then the doctor's going to tell you go to the commissary and buy Benadryl. And they basically treated everything with Benadryl or ibuprofen. So they, you know, they pretty much ignore the symptoms that a person has. Um, I'm a medical doctor uh, because I was having chest pain, and um, they just looked at me, put a stethoscope to my heart and said, oh, you're okay, go back. I said, no, I think I need an EKG. And of course, they knew I was a physician. So then she kind of swirled her face up and then cooked up the wires to check, to check my chest with an EKG. So, you know, there's, they really don't care about treating you. They, um, one perfect example is Dr. Stephen Henson. He's in prison in Kentucky. He lost, he had a retinal detachment, which means that he basically lost his vision in his eye. He went to the to the doctor. The doctor supposed or supposedly referred him to the hospital for immediate surgery. Three weeks later, he goes back to the doctor. The doctor's for follow up for his surgery. He was never transported. He he, he they finally did get him transported to the hospital. I do not know currently what his status of his vision is. But here we have a perfectly innocent doctor. Uh, spending time in prison, losing a vision of one eye, and they do nothing about it. That's standard medical care in the prison system. What, what steps do you think that the, uh, the U.S. government could take to assist prisons in handling a coronavirus epidemic while still ensuring that, you know, those folks that still need to remain in prison remain there? If they can determine, and I think they can in a very easy manner, who is not a danger to society, which is basically all of your low level crimes, if they could immediately get all of those doctors released, then they need to put all of the ones, the inmates that are a danger to society in a specific prison, then turn those other camps or FCIs into hospitals that we can then, because they would be perfect to be able to isolate the people with coronavirus because you've got the um, individual rooms that are protected. Mm -hmm. You have the entire prison that's protected. And then we, they could be used in a more functional manner. Uh, this would need to be something that we need to be done rather quickly in, in starting with the release of the prisoners. Well, that's a, that's a very good point. In fact, I noticed that just a few days ago, Attorney General William Barr did call for federal prosecutors to utilize home detention um, measures and, and other measures that will still uh, ensure that, that, that um, folks who, released aren't, who are released aren't going to reoffend, um, but to utilize those statutes in order to free up some of the space in institutions. So it, it appears as if they're sort of listening to you, Linda, and I think that that's a, that's a really good point. Do you think that um, as a result of the coronavirus, and we've been hearing that there's a lot of scams out there, um, there's a lot of people professing cures that aren't necessarily, well, none of them are effective because there hasn't been a, a cure or a vaccine announced for coronavirus yet, but do you think that the Department of Justice is going to pivot and start investigating health professionals for their treatment of patients during the coronavirus epidemic? I think that's a possibility. I think that any doctor who uses telemedicine to prescribe opioids to their patients is basically getting set up. 
And I have heard that the DEA actually wrote, uh, wrote something to say that that would be allowed, but I have not personally seen it because it doesn't apply to me. But um, I do know that states have said that the vet doctors can use telemedicine to treat their patients. But a state law, if it's not in the federal law, they can still come around later and attack those very doctors for doing what they thought was appropriate medicine and, and able to do it. There are actually statutes in the, the Controlled Substance Act that do allow for telemedicine and allow for prescriptions to be sent to, to, doc, to people that have not seen the doctor for over two years, but then they, they haven't paid any attention to that statute either when they charge every doctor that goes, that goes to trial with not having done a proper exam on every visit even though pain is a subjective treatment, a subjective case, and a doctor doesn't have to listen to your heart, listen to your lungs, you know, feel your knees or whatever to determine that you still need your pain medicine, but they're still being attacked in the court for not doing that physical exam. Yeah, so what I hear you saying is that with relaxing some of the regulations and requirements of, um, of telemedicine, the requirements of establishing physician-patient relationship with certain patients through telemedicine, uh, with the inability for a lot of physicians to sit in the same office with their patients as a result of social distancing requirements, do you believe that if, if, if doctors right now uh, take those recommendations by um, HHS and uh, other healthcare entities to heart that they may end up getting trapped into relaxing their standards for treatment and ultimately may be a target of the federal government going forward? Yes. Well, that's, that's very concerning. And I think I would offer um, a, a caution to physicians out there who are um, intending on changing the way they practice in order to be able to continue to practice uh, with coronavirus. Um, at stake. I think, I think it certainly makes sense that when physicians relax their diagnostic criteria, relax the implementation of the physician-patient relationship, or relax that physical exam that they would normally give a patient, that they make sure that they're exercising other ways to ensure compliance by a patient, to ensure lack of diversion, um, and whatnot. I, I received a phone call from a client not too long ago um, who indicated to me, listen, Ron, I've got a, a urinalysis testing lab at my facility and um, you know, the, um, uh, the CDC requirements require that I give uh, urine drug screens at uh, regular intervals for patients, random but at regular inter intervals. How can I possibly with social distancing requirements have my patients come in and drop a, a sample in a lab? And that was a, that was a particular problem for him with the CDC uh, guidelines and other state medical boards taking issue with the failure to uh, require a urine drug screen and urine drug screen testing that begs the question, how can physicians prescribe opiates in the current coronavirus epidemic uh, without having that physical contact with a patient and physical exam, urine drug screen, and all of the other things that a physician is, is required to do. Um, do you have any recommendations, Linda, for resources that physicians can go to in order to determine uh, how they can best be compliant while navigating the, the coronavirus epidemic and the changes in treatment? Document, document, document in the record. If they see a patient with telemedicine, they need to get the, you know, have the history. Now that pretty much everybody on electronic medical record, it's not difficult to document everything that you, that you say and, you know, get the, the, the VAD scale to the patient. And I'm talking old, old herbs, you know, here, these things, herbs might not be used anymore. The VAS scale is the, you know, how, what numbers you're paying from zero to 10. Um, but if they, you know, use the, the, everything that they can to document to show that a patient has a, a need for the medicine, that's number one, um, to make sure that the patients that they do have have, have no red flags uh, that the government looks for that they haven't, for example, gotten their medicines, how can you say early? Nowadays with people trying to get things done, that's one of the things I see on Facebook is people are trying to get their medicines because they're going to town and their pharmacy is 85 miles away and the pharmacy says, no, we won't fill them until they're two, two days before they're due. 
that has to be relaxed a little bit. But pharmacies also are in the uh, jeopardy because they're being used as policemen to, to target the doctors, or they themselves also can become targeted. So, I mean, it's basically just a, a cat and mouse game. You mentioned the term red flags, and it's a term that I'm very familiar with. It's a term that's been in the DEA literature. It's a term that's been used by the federal government constantly. Can you describe for our viewers and our listeners what that concept of red flags means for those people who aren't familiar? Right. A red flag is basically something that you notice when you are visiting with your patient or when you, are, when you have a doctor-patient relationship, something that stands out that says, this is a potential uh, patient that might not be using their medicines appropriately. They might be addicted to their medicine. They might be selling their medicines. So those are, quote, red flags. And if a doctor continues to prescribe medicine to a person that has those red flags, whether he's recognized them or whether he hasn't, doesn't even know about them, but the government recognized them, then the, then the doctor is considered to be guilty of of um, distri distribution of medicines um, to the illegal market. So you have to be, and things like would be things, well, I'm, pers I'm talking my past when I was in practice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no longer true today with mar medical marijuana. But when I was in practice, if, I, if a patient came to me and in their urine drug screen, they had marijuana in their urine, if I was to continue to give them a, 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 an opioid, I could be held liable for, you know, prescribe it for giving something that they might then take to the street and sell. So then there are doctors out there that, that you know, don't, that even though there is a something in the urine drug screen that shouldn't be there, they still prescribe. But you see, that's a doctor's decision. And the doctor and the, and the patient explains, well, I didn't have medicine for this, so I took a tramadol or something like that. And tramadol shows up in the, in the urine. The doctor should be able to freely decide whether or not that patient still deserves to be on opioids. They should not have the fear that, oh, if I give this person an opioid, even though this person has all of these terrible diseases and needs pain re relief, I'm going to be trapped and, and uh, charged with a crime. You know, these are where the government is no longer giving the doctor the decision to make medical decisions in the office. So, uh that, that, that's a very interesting point, Linda, and I appreciate that. And just to follow up on that, I've noticed that, that the, the term red flags has been used by the government, by the DEA, by the Department of Justice to standardize um, its own standard of care, so to speak. Um, so uh, there's, no, there's no list, as you know, uh, of red flags that's ever been published out there, right? But it's whatever DEA investigators or the government's experts think um, at that point in time, a red flag is, right? And the interesting thing about red flags is that um, because there's no list, because there's no formal standardized um, requirement of red flags, it's a way for the Department of Justice to tell doctors what they should be doing without formally creating a standard of care. As you know, the federal government can't create a standard of care. That's for the states and that's for experts to create. But when they start using terms like red flag in the context of you need to do frequent analysis tests to determine if the presence of the controlled substance indicates that the patient is using it. And it may be a red flag if the controlled substance isn't in their, in their urine after a urine drug screen. But you and I know that um, uh, oxycodone, for instance, the metabolite might be excreted from the body in as little as 12 hours. And so if a patient used up their medication early and their urine test was negative, that might be a sign that they weren't using the controlled substance, possibly, right? But what's another explanation, Linda, for why the controlled substance may not be in their system? They're gas metabolizers. That's one of the things that on Facebook, a lot of patients are talking about now is the fact that there are certain enzymes in the body that actually, actually uh, excrete and get rid of the metabolites of an opioid faster than others. And this is genetically determined. People actually have the gene for this. So this is something that actually, if they ever needed to, because I'm, I'm personally against the uh, criminalization of drugs to start with. We need to do away with the Controlled Substance Act. But as long as we have it, then we need to be able to identify those patients that aren't going to have 
um, medicine in their system if they get a drug screen. Of course, if I was a patient and on pain medicine, I would have one pill sitting there in my medicine cabinet to be taken six hours before my doctor's visit. Of course. <laughs> and, and you raise a really good point there. Um, the patients that don't have it in their systems are, are likely to be the more honest patients because every other drug dealing patient out there knows that they should just ingest a pill prior to going into the doctor's office so that they test on the urine drug screen. Just to back up, um, lack of the presence of the controlled substance in the system may also indicate escalating use, which could mean that their pain isn't controlled by enough medications. Um, or it might mean that they're hoarding medication because they might fear that they won't get it. In this environment, have you experienced this uh, significant amount of patients that you've interacted with um, who are afraid that they may not receive medications from their doctor in the future in order to relieve their pain? Oh, only about 100%. Yeah. And what do those patients do when they, when they fear that they can't get controlled substances from their physician to control their debil debilitating pain to get out of bed in the morning? Well, they're, of course, very anxious, and there's really not a whole lot they can do about anxiety because now you are you break the law uh, or you get charged with a crime if you uh, if you prescribe a, a uh, benzodiazepine at the same time you prescribe an opioid, even though it had been done safely for 20 years, 20 plus years. Um, but, the, you know, the, the anxiety is actually what's driving a, uh, one of the things that drives addiction up. So the government attacking doctors and the, destroying the doctor-patient relationship is actually creating addiction in this country. But then what they use that with is saying, oh, well, look at the rate that addiction is rising. We've got to put more of a clamp on the opioids again. Do you feel, um, on that note and, and, and hiring a lawyer, do you feel that adequacy of representation for physicians out there is an issue and one reason why physicians may um, accept guilty pleas when they, they feel that they, um, that they aren't actually guilty? Oh, definitely. There, there, there are literally, in my opinion, your office is basically the only one out there in the country that has any clue as to how to handle these cases. I have yet to meet any other medical, um, practice, medically um, oriented law practice that knows how to handle the defense for doctors being charged with this crime. Um, and they generally all use the standard white collar approaches, which simply won't work. Uh, the, uh, you know, they, they need to, uh, there are lawyers, there's, a, there's a, a big empty hole of need for lawyers out there that can properly defend doctors in these cases. And they, I just don't see them out there. Well, Linda, thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words, and uh, I, I, really, I really appreciate that. That means a lot to us here at Chapman Law Group. Um, what, on that note, what, what things do you see um, attorneys doing that are effective in defense of these physicians? And just to back up, um, I understand that you have followed and tracked most cases in recent history against physicians in this country, and therefore may have a catalog of knowledge that surpasses most people's knowledge, even the Department of Justice. So. What types of things are you seeing that doctors should look out for in terms of allegations? And what types of things have you seen that are um, potentially effective in defensive physicians or maybe prophylactically in ensuring they don't get um, in the DOJ's um, targets in the first place? I am definitely for everyone going to court. I do not agree with a plea agreement. A plea agreement, even though I know doctors are forced to, and when I talk with them, I don't tell them you have to go to court. I say, this is a decision only you can make. But in my opinion, if the people who took the plea agreement back in the early 2000s, that has led to where we are today. Because if they had stood up and said, I am innocent, and not pled and say, oh, I am guilty of doing this, all that does is open the door for the next victim, and the next victim, and the next victim, especially since if they can get a doctor to plea, like in the first six months of the raid, then, you know, they're hitting doctors just, you know, snap, snap, snap. They are not going after the next one. And that term that they're using is illegitimate, me or sorry, legitimate medical practice. Legitimate medical practice absolves doctors from charges. 
And so what the government does and say, oh, well, you're not using legitimate medical practice. But like you said, they can't define what legitimate medical practice is because it says in the Controlled Substance Act, only a doctor can determine what is legitimate medical practice. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they, they need to, in defense, show that the Controlled Substance Act is being used illegally and that no doctor treating pain can be charged with it. This has been determined multiple times by the Supreme Court, even to the point now where the Supreme Court won't even hear any more cases on this because they've put, they've put the decision down so many times that in order to be charged with a Controlled Substance Act, the doctor has to be selling their scripts out on the street to, a, to an addict, and they're not. They're treating patients. So my opinion, no white collar. Let's look at the record and see, okay, this T is crossed and this is I, I is dotted. Bottom line, if there is a patient record, the doctor is treating a patient and is exempt from prosecution. But how they're still being prosecuted and why though that defense is not striking home with people, I do not know. Well, I'll, 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 tell, you, I'll tell you exactly why, Linda. Um, it's, it's, it's basically for two reasons and, and some of the things that we've already talked about. First of all, um, we've seen Chapman Law Group have seen, I've seen, uh, you know, other criminal attorneys that, that I've spoken to who, who, who work in this area have seen that, that most people, including the federal government and many criminal defense attorneys out there, misunderstand what the standard is. As you know, a doctor can only be convicted for prescribing outside the course of professional practice for no legitimate medical purpose. And as you've indicated, when a physician is, is treating a patient for a painful condition, period, if they are doing that, they should be exempt from prosecution. Instead of backing off when the government sees treatment, they explore further and they say, okay, well, we understand this doctor is trying to treat this patient, but let's take issue with the nature of the treatment, the amount of the treatment, with the, um, the determination of the doctor as to whether or not any red flags exist. So, so instead of what the Supreme Court said in United States versus Moore, the federal government backing off when they see the doctor is treating a patient and realizing that the doctor is exempt, the federal government has created all of these sorts of requirements, including the CDC guideline, to dictate to doctors what type of treatment they need to offer. And if a physician isn't offering the type of treatment that the Department of Justice wants, they accuse that doctor of ignoring federal guidelines, of being deliberately ignorant towards the the fact that the patient may be drug dealing or selling their medication. And that's what puts doctors um, squarely in the, in the crosshairs. I believe that if the federal government clearly understood the standard that, that they, they needed to adhere to prior to prosecuting, m fewer physicians would be prosecuted across the board. I mean, you and I are, are aware of the, the, the Florida pill mills in 2007 and 2008, where a physician may just be you're writing prescriptions on a blank prescription pad and, and, and essentially selling, selling his prescription writing authority to people who are filling oxycodone, you know, 40s, 50s, in very high amounts. But that doesn't really happen anymore. It seems like the federal government has cleaned up most of that. And now what they're doing, as you've indicated, is expending those same resources on going after doctors now with a different standard and a different approach and criticizing the type of medicine that they're practicing as opposed to seeking to criticize whether or not they're practicing medicine in the first place. And then the second issue that we've seen um, is that in many cases, defense counsel in these, in these types of um, these cases, opiate cases, are afraid to put the medicine on trial. They're afraid to put patients on the stand and have them testify how, you know, Dr. Cheek helped them. They're afraid to put uh, employee witnesses on the stand to testify how compassionate and caring their employer was. Um, they're afraid to put the government agents on the stand and cross-examine them as to why they sent an undercover into the office of the physician who had a very negative MRI findings and clear indications of pain and why they think that's probative of whether or not the physician is drug dealing. And we have this reluctance to go to trial, as you've indicated. In, in many of the cases that you've seen, have you seen physicians reluctant to go to trial where they, they otherwise um, should have considered going to trial? Oh, yes, many times. I mean, pretty much every doctor that ends up taking a plea uh, does so because they're afraid to go to trial um, or they don't have the money to go to trial. 
Another yeah. thing that they did was they dragged the cases out two years, three years, four years. Uh, their, whatever resources the doctor has gets eaten up. And then finally, when it's t- trial time, uh, or have any resources to, to fit, fit the cost of the trial, and they're forced into a plea agreement. So, yeah. uh, yes, most all doctors say, why is this happening to me? I haven't done anything wrong. And yet they still do consider taking a plea and saying, yes, I have done something wrong. Yeah, I think the defense in these cases is a lot more simple than a lot of attorneys, attorneys lead, um, uh, lead us to believe. Uh, many people spend hours and maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars reviewing every shred of discovery that, uh, that the government has given them um, with respect to a particular case when our formula for defending these cases is relatively simple. You put the physician on the stand because you have to have them get up there and explain their practice of medicine. I mean, it's ultimately a defendant's choice whether or not they want to testify, but oftentimes the jury really wants to hear from them. You put patients on the stand who say that their life was changed for the better by this physician and they're carrying compassionate treatment. And you put employees on the stand who will also support that narrative as well. And you have yourself a pretty decent chance right there at getting the true picture across that this physician was a well-intended physician who may have occasionally stepped outside of the rules and maybe occasionally document in a perfect manner but was otherwise intending to treat patients and intending to practice medicine. And at the same time, you really have to put on at trial this difference between the government's version of the standard. They want every physician to be the best possible physician they could have ever been at trial and then argue that this physician was lower. Um, But the defense really needs to put on that lower standard and show the jury that in order to convict, the federal government must show that this physician was not intending to treat a patient, not intending to practice medicine, and not intending to prescribe for a legitimate purpose. And you do all of those things, and I think that you end up with a, a lot better shot at, at proving your case than, um, than, than many other physicians I've, I've, seen, I've seen go to trial. Um, wh- where's your website, and what other social media platforms do you utilize? Yes, the website is www.doctorsofcourage.org. And then I'm also on Facebook at Doctors Parentheses and Patients Parentheses of Courage. Because I never really intended the, the website to be only for doctors. It is for all people affected by the lack of pain management. So I just really do hope this is one of the actions that Doctors of Courage is working on right now is to try to get all those doctors that have been improperly imprisoned released so that they can help with the coronavirus and hoping their payback will be if they stay alive through it, that they literally will be protected from being attacked again in the future. Well, Linda, you raise a great point. For those physicians that are obviously nonviolent offenders and not a continuing threat to society because they can't prescribe controlled substances anymore, they can't bill Medicare anymore, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense that those people aren't able to at least help and run a ventilator or treat uh, and assist with the treatment of some patients. That, that certainly makes a lot of sense. I, I applaud your efforts and the efforts of Doctors of Courage to get the voice out there and, and to provide a place where physicians who are often accused and alone in this world can go and hear from somebody who's been through it and hear from somebody who's been through it and seen the worst of it and made it out on the other side, uh, which is what, what you can certainly represent to them, but also find a community. And, and I think that uh, I've noticed that a lot of my clients have taken a lot of comfort in um, the ability to, to speak and, and uh, to, to at least see other physicians who are going through this and an email back and forth, that's, that's wonderful and helpful, even though they're all going through something very terrible, knowing that somebody else has gone through it and come out the other side um, is, is helpful and provides a lot of comfort uh, for them. So I really thank you for providing that information and that resource out there uh, for your passion and for your vision, uh, for also collecting a lot of the cases that we've seen out there. I, I, can, I can tell you that in researching particular doctors, I've come across your site many times and read what you've written about them to find out what their, what their past was like and what they've went through and, and some, of the, um, some of the trial results. So it's certainly been helpful. Um, with that, do you have any questions for, for me uh, or, or for, um, for us about our approach to these types of cases and what we do? 
No, I just think you just need to continue doing a good job, Ron, and keep continue to defend doctors that are, uh, that uh, do cho choose to go to trial and um, and and or help them with the decision making in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, I just one of the things mentioned that she said earlier about at least doctors that are finding my site and getting some help there. Um, I guess the one thing that keeps me going because. I'm not seem to be getting anywhere with teaching people the real cause of drug abuse that will stop these attacks completely. But at least um, I have been getting feedback from doctors that find my site and they say basically finding your site and seeing that I'm not alone in this has kept me from committing suicide. And that to me keeps me going. Yeah, that's wonderful, Linda. I, I, I'm, I'm certain and I know that that's the case. Um, just about every one of my clients that I've talked to about about resources, I've, I've mentioned your site and they've said that they've already found it. Um, that's, that's commonly the case. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Uh, I hope that you stay safe and, and well where you are. And, um, and I appreciate your insight about the opiate epidemic, about coronavirus, and uh, sharing your perspective. It's been very helpful. I'm sure it will be very helpful for the viewers of our, of our podcast. So thank you very much for speaking with us today. All right. Thank you so much for having me, Ron. I'll talk to you again in the future. All right. Thank you.